Thank you so much. Thanks so much for you all to come here. Uh, my name is Alex Coqueiro and responsible for the Solutions Architecture team in AWS. In my case, covering Latin America, Caribbean, and Canada, helping go customers from government, education, non-profit organization, and healthcare in the journey to the cloud. Yeah, I'm here today to talk about robots and machine learning AI and share a little bit about how you can use it for your uh, business and how can you use those technologies to help to, ha to have a better world. Let's see here, it's not working, okay, good. So I know that some people here has experience with machine learning, others not. So what I do now explain machine learning without equations, but focus on how you can put things together in order to follow all the presentation. In that case, I use the Rubik's Cube, the Rubik's Cube example. So I like it because it's a very easy way to understand the potential of machine learning. In that case, Rubik's Cube, the idea is how to put all the face in the same color. So if you just follow the traditional way to develop application, let's say, uh, put all the if then else in order to create the solution for it, you probably will come up with something like that. It's about 43 quintillion unit combinations, which means that the traditional approach to write code won't work in this kind of problem. So which requires you just think differently. And how can think about it? Just change all your, your mindset. Instead of going there and provide the rules, the idea is how you can have the machine learning to the data and create the own rules. It's just a different mindset. When you have this mindset, you have something like that. First, data. Without data, it's impossible going anywhere. I see that some people are from business analytics and data lake as well, it's perfect, because it's the core of the machine learning. So as soon as you have the data, the next step is create the model. When you think about the model, think about like a recipe, about all the steps that you need to do in order to learn some specific task. And as a result, of this recipe, you have the, the, the function model, or the abstraction, or the mathematical function that you provide a solution for the problem that you have before. In this case, the solution to fix the issue or the challenge of the Rubik's Cube. The only problem is when you start working with machine learning, you can just see something like that, like accuracy. Accuracy, think about how precise I am about the model that I just created before. In that case, I have 1% of accuracy, which means that for this model specifically, I know how to deal with uh, this combination of Rubik's Cube. But I didn't learn exactly how to uh, uh, deal with that under different circumstances. How can you improve your accuracy? Bring more data. And then you have more data, the key is understand, okay, how much data I need or how much accuracy I need in order to deal with the problem that I propose to. In that case, it's about training. And when you talk about training, put data that try to not memorize your solution, but instead bring the generalization. Or literally, your model should learn how to deal with uh, the combination of this problem, in that case, the combination of Rubik's Cube. As soon as you have a model, one question that you need to ask your model is, how, ac how accurate is my model? In that case, 95%. 95% is good or is bad? Actually, I don't know. Depends on the business case. If you're talking about some computer vision problem to identify between cats and dogs, maybe it's perfect. Maybe you have like 80% of accuracy, you'll be fine. But if you're talking about, in my case, government, talking about uh, 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 law enforcement, it's a completely different case. So probably the recommendation is going to something about 99%. You see, there's no right or wrong. It all depends on the user case. In our case, it's good. For Rubik's Cube, 95% is enough for us to play. Uh, what you need to do as a next step is 
create inference. Inference is when you put your model to run. In that case, it's not the presentation about machine learning, it's the presentation about robots, or representation about how to integrate logical stuff, the model, with physical stuff. Because Rubik's Cube comes in something like that. It's an object. And then the integration between robots and machine learning starts to make sense because it's a way that you can link the digital world with the physical world. In that case, just to have a notion uh, of uh, how fast you can fix it, the world record of dealing with Rubik's Cube is about 2.4 seconds. It's a, it's a guy in Korea. Cool. Let's have the integration between machine learning and uh, robotics doing things together. Done. Point nine. When you think about improving productivity, when you think about integration, physical and digital world, is the solution that you can have. Point nine. That improves a lot about productivity. But maybe you just challenge me now saying, hey, okay, but how can I make money find a solution for Rubik's Cube? Or how can I create a better place to live with this problem? Okay, let's see real situations that when the same uh, method has been using in a real life. And I start by Amazon. So in case of Amazon, it's our fulfillment center. And we have these robots that are responsible for bringing products from one place to another place. Maybe you can say, hey, but this is easy. Yes, but imagine how much time I can save from people. It's especially on the scale of Amazon selling products all the time. You can have those things to make the life of people easier and better. In our case, reducing costs and enabling business like Amazon Prime to bring products in 24 hours. How we do it? Because those machines are helping us uh, to organize our products. This one specific is in Canada, is Macan, is a city close to here, that we have our distribution center organizing every single day our products in our distribution center. But thanks God that Amazon is not the only company in the world using machine learning. Actually, now using AWS, we have about 10,000 customers deploying the solutions for the most uh, beautiful use case that you can imagine. From retail for insurance, for insurance for healthcare, healthcare from government, that customers doing a lot of great things using machine learning. Let's dive in two cases to see how those things have been working now with folks on robotics. The first one is Leah. Uh, Leah is a robot to help uh, people, basically. Just me remove the sound. So the idea of Leah is helping people who have a uh, challenge to walk. Now if you imagine this case, we have a patient in a healthcare, in a hospital. Uh, they're not able to walk. They just ask, Leah, please come. There's a button, there's a support for guys, and we just go there to help these people to help. So not only Leah is helpful to guide people, but to find a balance.
that you have seen now, in compared to the one that I just showed before in the Amazon uh, distribution centers. It's just about code. It's just about creating different solutions for what you want. But today, the presentation about racing, and then next, next slide is about racing. I found the company in China, uh, Too Simple. It's a company specializing in autonomous vehicle. So the idea is this, this, this two videos was recorded from the camera of this autonomous car. So in that case, you can see that one very important aspect of machine learning is identify the environment that you have. Because when you think about robots, the environment matters, and matters a lot. So in that case, recording information at night, recording information during the day, uh, identify, okay, do I have car here, or do I have people around? And I like it, because I'm Brazilian. Uh, and then I've worked in China for a while. And Chinese and Brazilians, there's much more in common than I thought it was. And one of the things is Brazilians and Chinese don't follow the line to cross the street. They go everywhere except the line. Chinese are different. They usually follow things. And what I try to say is, if you take the model that was trained in China or even Brazil and try to bring it here, the technology is the same. But your model brings some odd answers because the environment is different. You see, all those details you must take in consideration when you are creating your model. Let's keep going. And now it's time to the rock and roll. Let's show those things, how, how those things work. Because examples and some three ideas about how we can integrate machine learning and robotics. So I define user case, and user case, as you can imagine, oh, I struggle with this slide today. It's about autonomous driving. And I'd like to expand the idea of autonomous driving, because when I talk about it, people think about cars. Ubers, or whatever you want to think about it. And actually, it's not. Because when you think about autonomous driving, you can think about trucks. You can think about this uh, picture in the middle with an agent uh, from NASA, GPL, using AWS to go to explore Mars. Again, same technology. Or uh, maybe, this maybe no, let me ask a question. Uh, could you raise your hand if you have a Roomba uh, at home? Pull some hands here. Roomba is this one. Uh, it's uh, a robot that goes to your home, clean your house, clean the dust. Means that you see, you think that robots is something so far, but actually it's not. It's much more close than you think it is. Okay. Uh, because now we are just narrow the topic. We are not talking about machine learning in general. We are talking about machine learning to, integra to integrate physical and digital environment. I'd like to provide some concepts for you. First, the model. The model that I explained to you before, the model that has the recipe or the steps that you need to do to accomplish some task. The second is the agent. The agent can be virtual agent, can be physical agent. In our case, our example today, you'll be physical because you want to have a robots. Uh, the action. The action is super important because the action will tell you what I need to do next. In case of, uh, 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 in case of robots, should I turn right? Should I turn left? Should I go faster? Should I go slower? Should I stop? All those uh, conditions are the one that you call as an action. Environment, environment is key, because it's different when you train a model in an open environment, like a street, in comparison to train a model here inside some area that you can control. We are talking about different problems. And finally, the goal. What you want to achieve, or what you try to accomplish, uh, in order to make your robot working. Like you see that Leah is the one uh, idea, but driving car, autonomous car, is a different business goal. So those things influence in the way that you develop all your machine learning pipeline. 
which means that different problems require different solutions. Or like us, we are, we are all here, maybe about 50 people, or we all learn differently. And you know what? Computers is not that different. They learn different, they have different strategies to learn as well. And in that case, I'd like to explain the difference between uh, the complexity versus the data that you have. In terms of data, I'll classify first in a call as a labeling data. This laser works, yes. Labeling train data. Think about label data as you have the data, but you also have the solution to your problem. So the idea is like a teacher. I will show you a bunch of examples, and based on the examples, your learning model, your learning function, you learn how to accomplish some specific task. When you have the label, we have a technique that you call supervised learning. So in a supervised learning is exactly the one that you can learn through this data. Like in a fraud situation, if you give me a lot of transaction with fraud, after a while, I will be able to learn how to identify a fraud. Or if I give the images about cats and dogs, after a while, I will learn how to differentiate between cats and dogs. When you think about autonomous driving, is the high-level architecture that you can use. First, you have the car. So when you have the car in a supervised learning, you need to generate the data with all the labels. Means that you need to drive for a while, collect this information. What kind of information? Information about how you drive, information about the camera that you have. Because the idea is I want to learn through uh, some example, I will learn about uh, based on the experience about someone else. So as soon as you have these people doing things manually, the next step is I want to move this data to the cloud. So I get information from the driver. I upload the information in some service like S3. S3, if you're not from, if you don't work with Amazon technology, is our storage service that you can store uh, objects. Uh, and then you can have your machine learning model go in there and learn to see, okay, how good or how bad I am uh, can drive based on things that I learn. And then after learning or after having the model that learning how to do it, you can deploy your code in your car and your car just star start taking all the uh, actions. Examples. And actually, is the one example, like this one is from 2017, the robot car. Uh, I like this one because first you can order now if you want to. It's a great way to learn things about machine learning. And the donkey car, this approach is an open source project using Raspberry Pi. Uh, using, is working with uh, supervised learning. As uh, 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 Ivan said before, you have access to these slides. You have more links here when you have the code uh, available. But basically, what the donkey car does is this. You have a track, and you collect this image. This model was trained before, and you just have your car following the directions. Try to keep in a road, saying, hey, have uh, some yellow and white, white is my limit, and try to follow as much as possible uh, the yellow line. So very easy way to start uh, using um, machine learning models. Let's dive deep on it. Uh, and then talking a little bit about uh, how those things were implemented. So the idea here is there's one more than one way to implement it. So for example, you can use computer vision without neural network, without machine learning, just to capture the image and see, in that case, following the white line is on one way. The good thing is you can do it fast. The disadvantage is the fact that if some child just crosses the street, well, we have a problem. So the model just work for uh, small tests. So the idea is create an evolution of that, implementing some uh, neural network, and probably one of the most common one 
For this use case specifically is the convolution neural network. So the idea here is first, I'll have someone driving. I will collect information about the images. Based on the images, I will apply some uh, modeling model, the convolution network, neural network, to learn how to recognize the image. And the way that the machine learning model learns here is very similar to the way that you learn. For example, just look at this image. What sounds here? Is going straight, turn right, or turn left? You see, turn left. The machine do the same. D the machine or the model doesn't even know what turn left means, but they know that, okay, in our previous images, when I have the image in this way, I'm turning x degrees. See, it's how supervised learning uh, works. In that case, you can uh, tell me something like, okay, but the good or the bad of my model will rely on how good the driver is. Yeah, it's true. Because if you have good driver, yes, you have good model. Otherwise, not that much. But it works, it works so well. Uh, but we cannot forget that when we talk about donkey car, we are talking about devices, or sorry, we talk about models that need to run in a very uh, restricted device without a lot of memory or computer power. I remember about 2016, the first models were trying to understand and try to map those pictures and they're using about uh, 2 million features in order to cap capture all the image that you have. Two million features, uh, and then with this pr is with this amount of uh, 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 resolution of the image, the Raspberry Pi was not able to handle more than seven uh, frames per second, which caused a lot of problem in terms of time to react about some problems. And so, uh, is people start to using things like okay. What about I try to compress the image or try to uh, reduce the size and the resolution of the image? So nowadays we have a pretty decent model using something about 128 to 150 uh, pixels or even models who are using about 50 pixels, which means that I'm able to, to process not about seven frames per second, but instead using about 34. So a lot of my images now processing and with the same capacity in hardware, I can be much more precise. It's exactly what you have here. As a model, you have the image, then you can apply different, uh, um, different ways to reduce the image. In that case, you have the image and then you start to analyze block by block with a group of pixels and when reduce it in a way that can in the end give you the opportunity to see, okay, should I turn right, should I turn left? I keep some models, I can talk more in details after the presentation if you want to, but basically using here convolution network and relu and max pooling in order to get or not to provide the model. Uh, behind the scenes, I use here the SSG multi box with the model uh, that usually it's a very good to do uh, one analysis in terms of image. So instead of using all the parallel processing, I focus on one image and doing it well over the time. When you think about it, okay, I spoke about some algorithms. I spoke about SSG in terms of single shot of the device to collect the image. I think the next point is, how can I implement it? What kind of tools can I use to deploy it? So in Amazon, we have a service called SageMaker. SageMaker is a service that allows you to develop the models or better, to have the control about all your workflow uh, to deploy machine learning pipeline. Let me just switch to the browser because now it's time for demo because I, I know that I spoke a lot. 
uh, and then let me show you how you can do those things. So here the Amazon console is the first time, if it is the first time you haven't seen it, have a plenty of services here available, and I will focus here in the machine learning one, the SageMaker. When you go to the SageMaker, you have several uh, functionalities here in terms of the console. But what's important for you is the major steps that you can provide automation using machine learning. The first uh, is about labeling data. So as soon as we save data, you have a feature that allows you to define and create a label on your process. L specialize a label if you have some uh, uh, specific conditions in terms of business, or more generic if you want to delegate to someone else. The notebook is all the development environment. The training services that you can use to parallelize your algorithm and finally, the inference that can create an API of your model. So here, I create an instance before. We have the one that I will navigate very, very, very soon that you can develop your code. You also have um, the training jobs. So as soon as you go there and train your job, you'll be able to see your job here. You also have uh, your endpoints. And the point is when you create the model, you just expose your model as an API because you just provide integration between different developers. Uh, and then finally, you have this function here is a compilation job that you are able to take your model and compile your model for a specific device. Because what I'm saying now is you don't need to keep your model in a cloud. You can train it in a cloud, and then, okay, now I have the artifact, I have the model, and I can copy this model to run whatever I want. As an example, the one that I just show you now. So let's start for the development side. So I'm going here for development, and you have a notebook. If you want to create your development environment, just go here and create what you need. S for example, uh, my dev my dev ml my environment for ml i put information about network my repositories from git if i have some collaboration environment with different people and then just create create a notebook instance is all you need so don't need to deal with libraries like conda or create all your open source. Just go in there and create your notebook. You can start from scratch in order to develop your code. So I have one that I created before. And then as the interface, if you have experience as a, as a data scientist, you'll see something very similar uh, on the way that you have been working now with the Jupyter uh, notebook. As a Jupyter frame, a notebook, I have here a couple of uh, models. I go to Donkey Car, the one that I just mentioned to you before, in order to show the code. Perfect. So we now we have the code. Now I am in the same environment as a data scientist. As a data scientist, because I'm talking about robots, I need to understand what I have in terms of APIs available for a specific robot. In that case, I install, I'm install. i using Python. Uh, I can use a specific library of Python. Uh, and then I will create like a virtual representation of my uh, physical device. So in that case, I create my virtual car, donkey create car. As soon as I create the car, my next step is I want to take all the image which was collected when I was driving, and then I want to copy this image for some storage service. In my case, using here S3. So S3, I copy my image, all my image collected from the car, moving it to the cloud. When you just go and try to see the image which was collected during the driving moment, uh, the manual driving, you see something like that. You see all the images which represents each track during your uh, race. 
and then you have a JSON which says, okay, for this image specifically, I turn right. For this image, I turn left. So I have a collection of everything that was uh, trained before. As soon as I have the image, I have the data available for me. And then is the time that start training the model. And my training the model can be aligned like that. I have Python, I can have my model here. I start training my model to collect the final result. Here, you can develop your uh, model using different languages or frameworks like SciPy, uh, AMXNet, or TensorFlow. This one is specifically using TensorFlow is specific. And remember what I told you before about uh, um, uh, accuracy. Here when you go uh, to those metrics, you are able to see uh, metrics that help you to understand how accurate is my model. What's the, the laws that I have in terms of my data? And you see that over time, you see that's ups and downs in terms of uh, uh, losses, in terms of how precise is my model. And then as a final result, when I finish here, I say, hey, I just passed my last uh, metric, and now I have the confidence that in, in that case, I have about 79% of the accuracy based on the training that I have with this uh, specific data. So after training my data, the last step is just copy the file, my model, back to the device, because my now device know how to use it. Uh, when you think about your model by itself, you are able to provide automation on it. For example, uh, SageMaker is based on Docker, means that remember in the beginning I did manually, I include or I add my library about donkey car. So in that case, I create automation, create my Docker in my machine, and then training, and as a final result of my code, let me just zoom here, You can have only this. Now I created do the Docker image before. I import the SageMaker in Python code. I just invoke the permission that allows me to go and run my model. And then I call it, co we invoke a method we call an estimator, which is a generic interface that allows you to train uh, your code no matter what kind of algorithm you have behind. So as soon as you train your model, the last step is I want to see uh, the convolutional network. Remember this slide that I showed before with all the pictures going down? What I have here is something very, very similar. It's here. This is the model. So I know that I spoke model many, many times. And now finally, It's there. Your convolutional network, our function, receiving this image, reshaping the image, because not all the details of the image matters for me. Then I apply different layers for each kind of model reducing what I'm looking. So based when you see reducing, think about, if let's say that I have a face. Uh, the first layer or the first line of the convolution try to see uh, where the border is, border is, or what the main uh, pixels of my image. In the second layer, I start to combine those different pixels to define, okay, where's my nose? Where's my ear? I'm trying to combine those objects. In the next layer, okay, now I know the details of my face, how to put everything together, and now able to identify, is this image about Alex? or is, is this image about somebody else? What I just described to you is exactly what we have seen on those lines. For each layer, I'm just combine different kind of uh, information in my image in order to bring the result that I need. Is Donkey Car, is exactly the way that the Donkey Car works. Very useful. Uh, but there's a one single problem. Supervised learning working so well when you have a control of the environment. If you don't have a lot of variables in your environment, 
you see? Because when you don't have a lot of variables, it means that you're able to get your data and label or put the information there. The problem is when you think about open environments, it's not a reality. And then you need to go for a different learning style. In addition to supervised learning, a different learning style is unsupervised learning. Unsupervised learning is the idea is I don't give you the answer and I expect you run your code or run your learning function to uh, understand the patterns between the data. So in that case, it's not super helpful in terms of driving by itself, but when you think about this use case, you can use for something like, imagine that you have a car and you have autonomous car and every, every day you go from your home uh, to work. Some days you take about 15 minutes, some days one hour. Uh, and the point is, hey, but I'm doing the same thing you know, over and over again. Why some days I took more time than others? Because you don't know the answer, actually, you don't know what you are looking for. And is when unsupervised learning helps. Because they look to the data and try to find what you call as outliers or basically try to find exceptions in your data. With the exceptions, you can run a different task to say, okay, now I know the exceptions, and now I can learn how to drive better, or how to arrive fast, because you can combine information about driving, plus information about GPS, information about different paths they took, and then you have like analytics dashboard to improve your process by itself. But when you focus about driving itself, then is when reinforcement learning starts making sense. Because reinforcement learning, you don't have the label that tells you what you need to do, but helps you to work in an environment that you don't have control. There's a key point of reinforcement learning. The idea of reinforcement learning is quite simple. Uh, basically, you uh, penalize when something goes wrong, and you reward when you have a good behavior. That's it. Like training uh, a dog, like if you just turn around or jump correctly, I will give you a biscuit, otherwise I won't. Because in the end of training, you just expect that your dog will do things so well. Reinforcement learning is exactly the same thing, but then apply it to uh, machine learning models. And it's where Jeep Race comes into place. Jeep Race is not a product, like you go there as an enterprise pod to use whatever you want. Jeep Race is a tool to help you to learn about reinforcement learning. Because what our customers has been telling us is, hey, reinforcement learning I can apply for several use cases, but put everything together sometimes can be complex. Maybe when I showed the Jupyter co uh, notebook, some of you said, oh, it's easy, I can do it. Or this, oh man, it sounds complicated. I'm just floating now. You see, you have the two people here. And based on that, Amazon says, okay, let's provide a fun way for you to understand and then just deploy it in your uh, use case. So the Jeep Racer is the full autonomous a scale race car that helps you in terms of integration about how to apply everything that I told you so far about reward. Jeep Racer comes with three major blocks. First one is device by itself, which is this one. So it's a hardware uh, that you can use to run things. Let me just turn it here. The only problem is I need to put it in a, in a floor. Just turn my cell phone here. It's time to see the car running. Just give me a sec. Yes, 
I will put it on the floor. Just turn on everything before. Oops. Okay, I hope it works. So if you want to stand up, feel free to do so. <laughs> yeah, sorry, there's no easy way to do it. But as a car, they start to take actions. And as a car, to see, okay, I have the image here, I have some situation. Yeah, just turn from me, please. And you understand very, very soon why they are doing crazy things. But this moment, just to see in that case what I'm doing now is just exploring the environment. There's one cable that I see here. I love I love physical things because you never know when your cable start bother you. <laughs> <laughs> the environment is there. So what I try to do is just mapping the environment. <laughs> it's not easy to wonder here. You see, exploring the place. But you got the idea, that so because things are getting dangerous. <laughs> yeah, and, you want to, and I did it in a purpose because I like to understand why things were crazy here. Why did the robot make the crazy? Which is the next part of the presentation. If you want to sit down back. Oops. We go back very, very soon. Oh, thank you. I hope you were able to get. Yeah. So basically, what you have here, the robot, you s yeah. In the interval, you can run more. You have the environment that you should training, environment. Uh, and then, let me explain why they got crazy. Because this environment is new for them. I've never have like a representation about the environment with those chairs or this environment, or even this, this luminosity to see, okay, what I should I do next? And hey, he tried to find a track. Didn't find, moving forward. Oh, I found a chair. I don't understand because I didn't, I've never learned that this kind of material is a chair. How can you do it is the part of the middle, is the virtual simulator that I will show you very, very soon. So the simulator has only created all the 3G environment, for example, representing this room pushing a model for the model to start to learn and take the right action. For example, one right action could be like just turn. 
about, uh, around this place. And the third one, in the racing league, because they find that people like to collaborate with each other, and the racing league is a worldwide competition that you can develop your model, publish it on Amazon, and you compare yourself with everybody else. So we have competition about the around the world. Uh, actually, we have the first one in Canada in October, in a Toronto summit. Uh, we had others in France, Germany, China, uh, UK as well. And then actually, I think Toronto will be the last one worldwide. And the, the, champi the champion in uh, Toronto, you go to Las Vegas to compete with the champions in other places in the world. You see, it's not about learning by itself, but also about having fun. Okay, let's dive deep in terms of understanding what, what I have behind the scene. So the first is track. It's like the one that I mentioned to you. We need to have a representation for your reinforcement learning. Learn. You see, and create rewards. When you create a representation, basically, you start design each element of your environment. For example, here the track, or the track center, or with the boundaries. You start to design each element in your environment, or the wall. Like here is like you cannot able to cross this line. The second part is the action space. So when you have the track, uh, what you need to learn is what the combination of possible things that you can do. For example, here, the action number one, the speed and how the steering angle. See, because if I steering or just turn, I don't want to go in the same speed as if I just go straight. I'd like to have all the combinations. And here's the key, because the time that you, the physical uh, capabilities must be linked with the logical capabilities. For example, uh, doesn't matter what kind of training I put my model, this device won't be able to be fly, because it's not a drone. You see, you must be sure that your capabilities are represented under the limitation of your physical device. Is exactly what we have here in terms of combinations. Let me just take it out. Uh, the next one is a re reward, the one that I expl explain to you the dogs. So in that case, you have your agent, and your agent must go to the blue box to the green box. For you, it sounds like a very straightforward problem. Just, hey, just go straight, and then you achieve the goal. Because I gave you a very simple goal. But imagine if I need to turn uh, over time. So in that case, what you do is something like this. In your code, in your reward function, and now I'm talk about code, I will show this code very, very soon, uh, you need to uh, create categories or uh, incentivize with points based on each, oops, yeah, thank you. Uh, points based on each direction that you have. What you're saying in this representation is, hey, Mr. Model, or Mr. Agent, if you just go straight, you get the most, the, you maximize the amount of points, but if you turn, I will just penalize you with less points. Uh, and then as soon as you have the reward, reward function, your next step is maximize all the points with exploration. So what you do now is just go then explore the environment in order to be sure that you understand all the possibilities and then after this exploration, you model, you learn. Uh, here's the code. So instead of just showing the PowerPoint, you go back and I like now compare the complex that I show you before on a way that I will show now, because basically I will do the same thing, but now using a Jeep Racer. So first, I go back to the console. The console has a specific service, Jeep Racer. Uh, and then I create the model. When I create the model, he explain more about the action function, the reward, the states as well. I define a name, my demo today. 
I'm sure that his name is not there. So the next step is, because this one specializes on tracks, what kind of track uh, I have? Because I can design others if I want to, but here in on different circumstances, but I have here the different tracks that Amazon provides to you by default for you to go there and run. I have the OVO here I'd like to use. The next step is about the actual space. So here you have the table, the one that you saw on the PowerPoint, and then here you can define uh, the maximum degree that I'd like to turn. For example, I wanna turn no longer than 20 degrees. Uh, I wanna have three levels of granularity. You see, as I go through these parameters, uh, the design just change here at the same time. Uh, the maximum speed, I'd like to go super fast, like five uh, meters per second. And the granularity that I have in terms of speed is three blocks of granularity. And based on the all the variables that I provide, they define my strategy in terms of possibilities, physical possibilities. And the next one is the code. As a code, you go there, reward function. You have uh, three samples that you are able to change if you want to. I have a strategy or reward, reward code that keep you as much as possible in the middle. Or a function that try to keep you uh, in the borders. Or a function that try to avoid some action like a zigzag from one area to another area. You define, you name it. You just define which one makes more sense. I, I select the first one. You Again, you can go here and change whatever you want. These are just templates. You have hyperparameters that I will talk very, very soon. And then you have the conditions. When I want to stop in terms of training. Start training, that's it. Could you see the difference between the one that I showed now in comparison to the one that I showed before? Because this one, even if you are not machine learning expert, even if you don't have the concept, it's a good way to start because it provides us, us several uh, layers that help you in terms of automation for you start learning and then give you time to go deep and then learn more about uh, a reward function. So I have one model here. And as a result, this one, the one that I, I just uh, keep, is the same step same parameters, I just is before starting this session, just for you to see uh, 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 one uh, running. If you go here, see the reward points, the points that they, they learning, the points that I get, the episodes, and the simulation stream. I will go back here very, very soon. Oh, and it's all the parameters that I, uh, uh, I use in terms of providing information, and then, yeah, and the training job with all the logs that I can use to create some analysis. Good, uh, let's go even deeper. So what happened behind the scenes is I have other uh, models that take and analyze this image using things like feature extractor that collect an image by image and then provide you some categories that can match with the table that I showed you before. With this match, uh, what, what I have behind the scenes of this match is the same SageMaker the same one that I showed before. So basically, when you think about robotics, it's just one of the options. But you can use, for example, this same methodology for finance, for games, gamification as well, or for industrial control. You have several layers that you can use in order to create your reinforcement learning outside of GPRacer. You know, GPRacer is just one example but you have this code available for you. You can use different models in terms of super scoring. Uh, you can use different environments, like OpenAI is a very popular uh, environment that they can use to represent physical uh, approach. And then libraries like RL Coach, RL Raylib, that you can use for your uh, uh, development. And in terms of 
platforms, you can use TensorFlow or MXNet. When you think about uh, reinforcement learning, there's a lot of... Oh, and the presentation is over. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I still have my presentation okay. running. This will boot up shortly. Okay. Yeah. I probably finish about eight. to see how to understand. So I can uh, go and identify each track. The important thing here is all those tracks, or all those information, we are able to get information from cloud watch logs. Cloud watch logs is where we record everything. Means that in offline, you can see the performance of your model in terms of track. You have this data there, you have the visualization that I will show you very, very soon. So now going to the physical part. Because at this moment, I show only the logic or the intelligence behind, but now I'm going to the physical part. So, RoboMaker, as I said, is an example. But for me, the importance is here. Because as a software, they have like the operating system behind the scenes. Uh, and these operating systems allow you to take control about each of those actions. Those kinds of things were implemented in a deep which means you don't need to go to this level of detail to deep it by itself. But when you think about the real world problems, you need to be aware of it. This is where uh, robots start to make sense. Because we see things like autonomous walker, like the Leo one. Uh, this one is from NASA GPL. This one is a turtle bot, really useful for you to use things. Or you can have like submarines as a robot as well. It's like endless in terms of possibilities. When you start to expand, the idea that I just show you today. Uh, and robots are trained. <laughs> like when the, the evaluation for our tech is by uh, 2030, we have about 70% of all uh, mobile uh, material doing things autonomously. I don't know if it will be 7%, maybe more, maybe less, but can, what can guarantee to you is more and more so see things Autonomous things just running uh, in your home, in your work, or whatever. Uh, 
sorry, I'm struggling with this one, not working properly. Uh, we can have life cycle of robots, and now talk about the physical part, the actions. First, we need to select the Oracle break system, uh, and then start developing your code for your robot. Uh, in terms of operating system, uh, one of the most successful <coughs> one is very, very popular is ROS. ROS is a robot operating system that has a low level integration that you can send commands. So basically, if you have experience with integration, uh, you probably is familiar with the published describe model, where you just send a message and then somewhere, someone else just consume the message. It's the key of the ROS. So the idea is I have several devices like uh, the wheels, uh, the, the accelerometer, uh, the camera, and then as soon as I publish the message there, they start to integrate with all the sensors that I have in my robot. When you think about it, uh, you can just install your server if you want to, but because you are in a serverless conference, you just can have a serverless uh, uh, robot as a service, if you can say it this way. Uh, and then when start, robot makers start to make sense. Because instead of installing everything by your own, you can just combine things in order to have the full cycle of the robot development. In terms of a robot by itself, I have four, uh, four key functions. First is the extension, which is the integration with other artificial or machine learning service if you want to. For example, if you want to integrate with voice, you can integrate with image, you have the extension for us, which will make it provide to you. You have the developer environment that I will show you very, very soon. And you have the simulation environment that allows you to create the 3D environment that I show you before. And finally, now I'm talking about one robot, but imagine like managing about hundreds of thousands of robots, you need to have a service that control everything to deploy the code in the right place. Uh, when you go to the robot maker, we have a lot of examples there that you don't need to start by scratch, that helps a lot when you think about learning about how to develop the code, because basically the both are together. Let's go in there. So here I'm moving from uh, uh, GP Racer, which is like the, the maximum abstraction that you have, to RoboMaker, which is a low level abstraction. You see here that I have some jobs running. Let me go into one of those. And, and as an environment, I can have a simulation of the physical environment. What the, the simulation that um, the RoboMaker use is Gazebo. Gazebo is a very popular uh, open source in the market. And you go to Gazebo, you are able not only to see your uh, machine learning model working or your simulation working, but you're also able to create the scenario that you need. So if you just go there and try to add some blockers, some trees, or to try to change the scenario completely, completely. When the model go there, oops, the car is going there. Just go there. You see, your model just go there and see the scenario and start to learn, explore each variable that you have, invoke the function that you can create, and then based on it, they'll be, they'll be better and better. It doesn't matter if it's a street, as I show you now, or it's just a, a, a factor, you see? or a motion, you just design your creativity is your lead. And what I like the most is the fact that everything is open source. Gazebo, ROS, you just have everything in a uh, very used way to integrate uh, your, uh, your flow. Now I show about simulation. This one is, is the one that I start with um, Jeep Racer. And if you go in a low level, you have the developing environment. In a developing environment, you can code, or you can define which functions you have inside uh, uh, your robot. So what I'm talking now is a low level to say, I wanna publish a message here to have one of the wheels running, or I wanna turn like 30 degrees, 
uh, in the next track based on some order that or some a command that I receive from somewhere. Who is somewhere? Maybe it's your machine learning model, just a, just a manual activity that you can send to the track. And here we are. Here's the code that go and shows you what you can do. So here, if I go there, I just launch. I, uh, they start to compile all my binaries, compile in a way that can be understandable by the physical device and publish it when I need to. If you need to uh, start like, hey, I've never developed a robot uh, code in the past, just go to the samples here. There's a tons of samples. And then those samples allows you just info, can we be able to see how the environment uh, done for you. I think one of the advantage of using RoboMaker is all the configuration is prepared by uh, AWS. You don't need to go through details about the configuration. And then when you see the final result, I think it's here. The code that we just I ju just saw now is this one. Completely different project. The one that I show is this one. As you see, uh, the same environment I use to depraise them is the same one that they can, can create anything else. That is just create a robot rotating to monitor uh, the environment to see what I have around of me. So this is the way that we can do things. Now we're very, going very, very close to the end. Uh, easy architecture from the beginning to the end. So in terms of integration. Wow, I think we will work. Because uh, I need to spend it here. Try to zoom now, zoom as this, zoom this time didn't work. Nope. Okay. So just sorry to be a little bit small and not I don't know why they're not zoom anymore. But here we have the model. When you create the model initially with SageMaker, they just use the compiler. This compiler is from Intel, the open Vino, that allows you to compile in a way that can com be compatible with your physical device. And during the process, you can collect the image. This image goes to the RoboMaker. All the red lines you have seen here is uh, what we call as a node, means that right after I collect the image, I publish it in a one message. This message is consumed by uh, the inference engine. The inference engine uh, go and say, okay, based on the, the result, this image, what I want to do next, what kind of command I should receive from navigation mode. Then I take the decision about the autonomous drive and then send the command that you go and follow the track. I can also have an option to go manually. So if I go to web server, that allows you to connect directly to the device, and this web server send the commands, I can do exactly the same thing. So automatically, with autonomous drive or manual drive, both are acceptable. So now going to your question, RoboMaker is the engine behind that gives life to the model. So the SageMaker actually just send the commands, so do this and do that, and the one that you do the, hard, the dirt work is the robot maker behind the scene that you can change completely. Uh, just to recap, so when you think about your process, you have data, you have algorithms, you have model, you have hard inferences. Uh, SageMaker is responsible for the first part, and robot maker is responsible for the last part. Is how you combine both uh, technologies together. Uh, and this code, that for me it's uh, like a lot, the Herbert Simo is, you're not expectators, 
but act as well in the future. Because sometimes when I present those things, people sounds like, hey, it's science fiction, you think 10 years from now to happen, actually not true. It's much faster than you think, and you see that we start not that hard, it's just about see what the best path for you specifically. If you have experience with machine model, you can go to stage make directly. If you don't have that experience, go to the racer to start training the model. If you like 3G, go to RoboMaker, create your virtual environment, and then start training everything that you do. Uh, and the last slide, uh, the panel there, you can know about AWS. Who knows? Uh, but uh, everything that I told you so far in this link, uh, you have all the information, demos, links, the code. So everything that I use here was based on samples to give you the chance to go back and start downloading <coughs> things and use it by your own. The only thing that's not here in this link is the Dunkey project, but it is in the slide. Everything else is there available. That said, thank you so much. I can exceed a little bit of time. But <laughs> When you go here, there's tons of variables that you need. This one is only available here in the console, but there are tons of properties that you can define. For example, 
prophets about the wind, prophets about the soil, like more dense, more uh, uh, rust, you see, or luminosity, like I'd like to see the sun. So what I'm telling you is when you go to, sorry for the resolution, but when you go to all these prophets, where you can find everything. Actually, there's books only about the Azibo, about all the prophets they find, and the way that they find those prophets are based in Jason. So when Jason said, I want to have a, a ring. I want to have a, 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 a cube in the middle, and then start to model in what, in what you want. For the machine learning perspective, in the beginning, we will be surprised, hey, I want to expect a cat, close this screen, and then you start to learn, and then you just need to make your reward function make sense to take the right decisions. But <coughs> that is a free dance. I think the zip is one of the best simulators in the market now. We are using version seven uh, initially, but now we recently announced the version nine, and the version nine is awesome about preparing the future world. Honestly, based on the skills that I have, I didn't think of, I didn't see a thing that I was not able to represent in the future environment. Am I saying that it's the right thing? I say 100% sure. No, it's not what I'm saying. When you, uh, when you think about robots, there's no way for you uh, to get the real sense if you don't have the physical environment. Because then we start to consider the point that you forgot to add in our model. Because we, here we start model, if you continue modeling things, and you are human, and you're like, hey, I've never thought about the wind. You see? So the physical model or these interactions you have to calibrate more and more. Okay,